Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro class. This is the third, third session of the office hours for the fall and winter 2023-2024 class. We have one question, so we're going to definitely address that. And then if anybody else has any other questions, we can jump into that. And I'll probably do a review of the upcoming assignments and just kind of talk a little bit about sector analysis and things to think about. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we are. And I'm going to pop this over here. So I'm looking at the camera. That would be good. And then we'll go to October 30th. Okay. So Christian has a question. How did you find your first design customer? What are the strategies that tend to work in your experience? This is a great question. So I have this uh, concept that I picked up from a colleague of mine, which is business. I think in all spheres, but definitely in, in the spheres of regenerative land design or ecological land design or permaculture design, whatever words work for you is there's a reputation capacity. It's kind of like three legs to the stool. So one of those legs is reputation. You have to build reputation in some way, shape or form. And we'll talk about that. You have to build your craft. You have to build the, the technician work, the craftsmanship work, the how do you build your craft? How do you know what you're doing and you're doing well? And are you receiving mentorship? Are you continually growing and learning all that? And then you need to have smooth systems, smooth business systems. So that includes not only smooth systems for you in terms of accounting, designing, archival uh, materials. We were just talking about that with a, a student, a former student that's become a, a mentee of mine. And you also need to have smooth sales processes. So in terms of how do you intake clients, talk to clients, process them in terms of payment, process them in terms of working with them and keeping them updated, uh, delivery of materials, and then helping them with next steps and whatever further offerings you have. So first off, I want to give that as a framework, sort of a first principles operation. Once we get into the idea of how do you get your first client? So part of it is you need to make sure that your skill level, your craft level is at a certain level where you know that you can execute well. And if you have any worry about executing well, then you need to go and source some level of uh, interaction with somebody who's a little bit smarter, who's a little bit more aware, who knows what they're doing. And that was the way that I worked at it. So I, for the first couple of, of designs I had, I went to my mentor, uh, who's now uh, one of my best friends in the world, and basically said, I'm going to I'm gonna pay you originally because I wasn't getting paid. So I paid him directly to help me with the design. And then as money was coming in, I passed it on to him to take a look at the work. And then eventually we started working together, which was a nice feeding way into a relationship. The number one way, kind of the big reveal we're leading up to it, the number one way that I found myself getting clients and that I've advised students for the last 15 years to get clients is to talk about what you're doing. So if you're not willing to put a shingle out into the world and say, hey, this is me, this is what I do. Here are some thoughts about what I'm doing. This gets into how to make marketing not feel weird and, and gnarly. Um, if you're not willing to put out that shingle, then you shouldn't be doing this work. If you're not willing to tell people, this is what I do, and this is why it's important, and, and here's some of the intricacies of it, and here's a couple of examples, and here's some case studies, and here's some people who like what I do, then you probably shouldn't be involved in the work you're doing because it's going to be near impossible to bring people to this work. There's really only one, I would say 99.99% .99 of the time to get yourself into this work, which is to be a self-contractor, to be an entrepreneur, and to, to offer your services directly. Every once in a while, there's a company that's growing. Um, somebody who's been in the business for five, 10 years, and they're looking for somebody new and looking for somebody that is usually not within the industry. So that way they can train in their particular way of doing this. Uh, what comes to mind is hatchet and seed contracting, former uh, former uh, colleagues of mine, or they're still colleagues of mine. Um, their business has grown. And I remember um, teaching, I was teaching a, it was like a six or five month PDC at Seven Ravens Permaculture Farm and Academy. And there was this young kid there named Tim. And uh, Tim was really keen to work. He was really keen on Elaine Ingham soil food web work. And uh, he just, he wanted to work with Hatchet and Seed and they weren't getting back to him. And I said, listen, call him again. I think you're a great fit. I'll let them know as well that you're coming. 
And Tim's been working with them, I think, for close to six, seven years now. So, and that business in particular has grown dramatically because they do such excellent work. So if you're looking at um, at, uh, at good examples for good social media, they would be a great, uh, great folks to take a look at. Personally, what I did is I started talking about permaculture. So I started offering introductory um, one hour conversations to permaculture uh, whenever there was an opportunity to talk at Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs, uh, local libraries looking for speakers. Um, the local organic food shop was sponsoring speakers about a certain topic. I'd go and talk. I would go and tell people about this work. I would go tell them about edible landscapes, grocery store landscapes. I would talk about water harvesting. I would talk about um, ecological and uh, ecological restoration or habitat creation. And that's really where I started to get people who were like, oh, you do this. Would you come and do this for me? So the very first client I had was somebody who was associated with the eco village I was living at. And I learned permaculture at originally the PDC was held there. And so I worked on their designs, um, basically told them that uh, whatever they wanted to pay me was fine as long as they were willing to put it in the ground. As long as they were able to take my design and put it in the ground and I could take photos before and after, that would be fine. And they said, yes. Um, the reason why I gave that uh, caveat is I want portfolio pieces. I want things that I can put out into the world and show people, hey, look what I did. And that's been one of the most successful things I've done, if you go on to allpointsdesign.ca under portfolio or projects, I think it's called, um, I got lots of projects there. And I I definitely need to take a bit more time and put like the last couple of years up there as well. Um, but there's there's been so many good projects and projects that I've been involved in and still to this day, only because I think they're good projects to be involved in. I'm doing it pro bono. And it also is a great project to put in the portfolio. It's another sphere or something that I've been doing that that I haven't been doing that I just want up there. Um, so that's been primarily the way that I've gone about it. Um, I found as well that sort of socially minded organizations. So there was a drug and alcohol rehab center. There was a food bank. There was, what was the other one? It was like a micro lending uh, community supported organization non for profit. They were all super keen to work with me and they would get the grants. And sometimes I'd get a little bit of money to do the design work, but they would always put it in the ground and it produced a huge amount of interest. Uh, my buddy, Eric Olson, who runs permaculture artisans, arguably one of the most successful permaculture design companies, his strategy was brilliant. And to this day, I still think it's one of the most brilliant things to do. He went to City Hall and he said, listen, your, your landscaping doesn't reflect this area. It doesn't speak to this area. It doesn't work with your official community plan or what you're saying is important. Let me design it. So he, he cold called City Hall. He's like, let me design it. Let me go out and design this. I will bring the workers. Uh, I will also advocate and call out to the community to bring people in. You pay for the plants and any material that goes in and we'll design and create an edible landscape that has native elements and it has food elements and has cultural elements within the First Nations that were there. And also because there's a large Hispanic population that had um, Hispanic, uh, Hispanic cultural plants that were there. And he said that lasted for about three years in terms of the amount of interest. So he was booked pretty much solid for three years because of that. So whenever you can create a, a, a buzz or a social cause conversation because of what we do as so socially, socially minded, that can create a huge amount of interest in what you do. Um, yeah, so I would say that's what's worked for me. As I developed a body of work and stand behind my body of work, uh, I've then taken the best advice. There's two pieces of advice. Um, one is from uh, the personal MBA, I think, by Josh Kaufman. I think it's called the personal MBA. I just saw the book back in the library. Um, great book. If you're interested in business or if you are frustrated by business and you want a really easy to digest book, it's brilliant. I think it's you know a quarter of the way through the book and he does ideas as chapters. And so if it takes like two or three paragraphs to write an idea, it's two or three paragraphs. If it's a single line, 
a single line. So it, I, I, I appreciate that brevity. And the piece of advice was advertising is the tax you pay for being unremarkable. So like Eric's example, we want to be remarkable in what we do in our advertising and what we showcase. So that's an important piece. And then the second piece of advice from my uh, colleague and good friend, Tad Hargraves from marketingforhippies.com is the marketing that works is the marketing you'll do. So if you're somebody that likes to write, uh, I've got a mentor for values-based decision-making in South Africa, Tristan Holmes. He works with groups and communities and businesses for creating better decisions. He's a writer. Um, he has a tradition of writing. So he writes these long medium pieces, these long blog posts. And so his work is then truncating that into little carousel posts for Instagram and other shorter posts, but he loves to write. So that's what comes easy and that's what he does. And that's what's bringing in work. I like to talk, obviously. Um, I like podcasts. I like being on podcasts. I like hosting them. I like working with them. So the majority of my work has really come through podcasts because I, I podcast so long with um, Diego Footer and his many, his many, many podcasts, uh, but I haven't done a podcast with him for three or four years. And I'm still getting residual interest off of those podcasts because people listen to them. They're perennial content. They're always there. Diego's always on the upward trend in terms of his listener base. So there's still people coming to, to, to interact with me on that conversation. Um, and then there's a fair bit of organic traffic that when I get interest for land design, um, people say that they were searching online, they were searching search terms, they came across my website, and they really liked my point of view. This is something that if you haven't thought about yet, the idea of point of view is really how you look out into the world. So think of it this way. Everybody who's a potential client of yours is on Island A or the Isle of Woe. This is where people are frustrated. They're, they're, they're angry. They, they're upset. They're having issues. And they're trying to get to Island B, the Isle of Wow. So the Isle of Woe to the Isle of Wow. And you come along on the, the, the good ship Lucius or the good ship um, uh, Minthia or the good ship Mindy, the good ship Tamara. And you say, good people of the Isle of Woe. I have your solution. Come aboard the SS solution and I will take you over to the Isle of Wow. And sometimes the way you look at the world, so the way and how your boat looks and how the rest of the water looks is what attracts people to your boat because you're talking about food insecurity or you're talking about better quality of life by having more natural surroundings or settings around you instead of just a lawn or you're talking about food security or insecurity. And, and that's a big part of your point of view. And that can pull people onto your boat and they, they can really get excited by that journey. They really like the journey. They like the way the captain, you, looks at the world. And you can bring them across to Island B. Sometimes it's the boat itself. Sometimes it's the mechanics and how you work those smooth business systems. I do what's called a good fit call. And it's not a sales call. It, it was a big change in the way I looked at sales is that I don't sell anything. I just see if people are a good fit for me. And that changed my idea of selling forever. Now it was just, are you good for me? And am I a good fit for you? And sometimes we're not. Sometimes somebody is like, well, you know, I've been using pesticides and herbicides for you and I want to keep doing that, but I'm really interested in this type of work. I've had a few of those, those clients and I just said, no. And then I immediately went and put that kind of information onto my website. So if you go onto my website, you'll, and you take a look at, are you a good fit under the about section? There's this whole list of things that says we may be a good fit if, if all of these examples of what you're looking at. Um, and one of them is something like I'm paraphrasing. If you can look out into the world, see the uncertainty, see the direction we're heading as humanity and still, still laugh at the ridiculousness that we've been given all of this splendor and we're messing it up pretty badly, we're probably a good fit because I don't work very well with the super rigid when it comes to this work, the folks that think, well, if we don't do this, the world's the world will end. It's like, well, 99.99% of life that's ever existed on planet earth is dead. Humans will have their time as well. So if anybody gets themselves too seriously, they're probably not a good fit for me because I just don't look at the world that way. And I can't. I can't 
go along somebody's ride and say, well, if we, if we don't get the garden in this year, the world will end. No, the world will go on and you'll go buy food at a grocery store. It's not going to be the end of the world. So I tend to try to distance myself from the fundamentalists because they take the fun out of everything by being too mental. Um, and then once you have that good fit process and you start to interact with them and you, you bring them in, then you get a sense of who they are and then you, you go into that design process. So in summary, reputation, reputation, reputation is how you get your first clients. How do you do that? Talk about, write about, let people know what it is you're doing. Find avenues or hubs. Hubs are places where your potential clients meet to go and speak and let them know what it is you're doing. Showcase your work, showcase examples of your work, what you're doing, how you're doing, what it looks like. If you like taking photos, Instagram, TikTok. If you like speaking, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, podcasts. If you like writing, short blog posts, long blog, blog posts on your own personal website, on Medium. Uh, turn those into short posts, uh, either on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. I particularly like using AI for truncating big content into short content. It's been particularly useful for a number of clients that I was advising, um, uh, landscape design clients, helping them to develop more of a voice. Um, that's been super useful. Uh, and then just have smooth processes to intake that interest, but also have some kind of digital gatekeeper. And that's the, uh, are we a good fit on my 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 website as well as my portfolio pieces have something that somebody can review you or interview you without taking up your time i have a really high conversion rate the number of people who call me to work with me it's like 95 to 98 percent now um the majority of the people who call end up working with me because i've given so much content into the world that people can look at that and go oh no no i know who this guy is i think we're a really good fit and that's what they'll say when they first email they're like i've read your stuff we're a good fit I'm like you think you're a good fit for me. We will see during the call if that's actually the case. Yeah, I think that answers the question pretty completely. Any follow-up questions from anybody who's who's on live? I know this wasn't anybody here's question, but um, any follow-up questions or comments, uh, things that have worked for you? I Go just have a question about this, which is... Um... I think this is something that maybe if people are trying to be entrepreneurs in this way, they're running into, which is how much do you think, um, you know, weighing both just permaculture design, sort of landscape design skills versus actual like tech and like communication literacy, how those like the split on how that allows you to sort of jump forward in, you know, a sort of individual or group business? Yeah, that's a good question, Lucius. Can you define or kind of color in tech and communication literacy? What do you mean by that? Or some examples so I can understand yeah, the question a bit Yeah, for better? sure. Um, well, I think it's like in this age, it's, you know, if it's whatever you're reaching out on, if you design your own website that's intuitive or, you know, you're reaching out on Instagram, doing your sort of reels and videos. Just like how important do you think those that like almost that kind of I know you had mentioned marketing, but like creating that sort of accessible portfolio plays in versus, you know, just being the guy who knows how to do the stuff really well. Yeah, yeah. I think you're driving at exactly how I how I started answering the question, which is if you're not willing to put out a shingle, don't do what you're doing because it's going to be nay impossible to get anybody in. So it's important to put something out there and how you do it is totally dependent on you as a person. So again, if 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 you like doing videos, if you like doing that stuff, great. If you don't, don't do that. It's gonna it's gonna feel like pulling teeth every single time and you're just gonna get frustrated. And the amount of people who come to me for specifically marketing advice um, and they're like, I was told I need to put out like four reels a week, but I hate being in front of the camera. Don't do that. <laughs> Just That's not the thing for you. Um, and do what it is that comes naturally and easily and maybe, maybe develop a, a, a capacity or an understanding of that. 
but you have to put out your perspective, your point of view in the world. You have to put out something about what it is you do outside of a website. The website is basically your digitalized uh, conversation you would have with people about your work, what you do, why it's important. That's what that is for a website. People think they make their website and now all the business is going to come. Not even close. It's it's basically you, your digital version standing in the middle of a field. If people don't know you're there, there's no reason for them to come, which is why TikTok, unfortunately, is so ridiculously incredible for bringing people to permaculture. I, I uh, Over the last three years in particular, the rise of permaculture in TikTok has been exponential. And the number of people who were involved in permaculture, self-studied, talking about it, came to the o OSU PDC and then talked about it in one TikTok. There's this woman I've, I've just recently been in, uh, uh, introduced to. Uh, I forget her name. I'd have to look through it up. But uh, she talked about it once. And I think on average, we've got 25 students per class that have come just from that one mention that have come to the course. So I think that goes to show that it's not just kids who are on TikTok one. And if they are on TikTok and they think it's something that their parents or folks who may have the capital or the interest to actually put it in a landscape design, an ecological landscape design would showcase. They want to show it off. Everybody, this is that culture of, of attention and also sharing. We always want to share. We always want to be the person that shares the cool stuff. And that's where I think TikTok and Instagram work really well. I, I love that my family members will send me permaculture related posts and videos on things that I have intimate, high level knowledge of. And they'll still send it to me on Instagram and and Facebook. They're like, did you see this? I'm like, yeah, I, I built something like that, you know, four or five years ago or last year, or I already do that on a daily basis. So people still want to share that. And I think we haven't yet clued into the fact that people like to share that kind of conversation. And this idea of sharing is really just about talking about things you like. You kind of look at it. I look at it as diary work. So it's like, if I'm going to post things about, for example, on Facebook, I just posted about uh, this this apprentice I have for values-based decision-making and just talked about how great it was working with them. That was it. There was no ask. There was no nothing. It was just like, I love working with this this dude. He's doing such great work. If you're interested in, you know, if you're a group or a community or a business and you want to look at better decision-making, he's, he's your guy. And um, yeah, so I would say you need to have some literacy, but don't, don't go for what you think everybody should do because if you do long form com con content, ideally when you put that out, you're going to get folks who are interested in that sort of way of being. So, and then you can use different tools uh, like AI to help you take that long form content and you know chop it up. I I've recently been working with um, Jan Designs. Jamie Wallace is an instructor in this course, and they came out and they were like, "Hey." we'd like to like build a little bit more of our reputation. We'd like to tell a few more people about what we do. And so within about two hours, I gave them a process that helped them to develop two years of content, which is basically taking a blog post, running it through AI, specifically chat GPT four and saying, pull out the salient parts of this piece of writing, turn those salient pieces into posts, suggest imagery for those posts, um, and then they could look through their archive and say, oh, it's asking for like a photo of this. And so they went through their archive and grabbed photos of that. Plus now they have a whole list of photos they need to go back to their previous clients of which they have extensive because they're an award-winning, beautiful ecological landscape design company for next year. So that way they, they kind of have a hit list so they can either hire a photographer or go and take a look around. And then uh, there's some great people on like, the gig economy sites like Fiverr or Upwork, specifically on Fiverr. And so I found this exceptional woman who creates templates specifically for Canva, which is a, a online graphic design um, uh, uh, URL as application, basically, uh, digital design program. And they made, the Fiverr consultant made templates. And then the templates are like Fertility Friday, Water Wednesdays, like they've got themes. And so they post, I think, somewhere between three to five times a week on Instagram and also on Facebook. And they've seen an uptick, like within two weeks, they had three calls. 
because they were just talking about their work. They were just talking about the things they were doing. And we made it kind of dead simple and easy. Um, and so ChatGPT is, is generally providing the rough draft for the content. They're then looking over it because ChatGPT is not perfect. It hallucinates or lies like 20 to 30% of the time. So sometimes it, it writes things that's like, you didn't even, you, you didn't do your homework. You did not read the blog post. Um, so you have to check it, which is fine. And then, uh, and then basically with that material, they now have, I think, I think what we decided is that half a day, every three weeks, they would do half a day of post creation. They would use an application called later to schedule all the blog posts. And then they would be done for three weeks. And then another half day, they would do all the work and then put it out. So yeah, literacy is necessary to a certain extent, but I wouldn't stretch it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like what I've said with this course, like don't spend the time in this course to learn a new program outside of what we've asked you to in terms of Google Slides. It's just not worth it. Does that answer your question, Lucius? Any follow-up questions? Uh, no. I mean, that that just helps. Uh, just, you know, I feel like we're all having to learn to balance a million plates, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's definitely another plate to keep spinning, um, which is why I try to make sure it's as simple as possible. Because I, if it's not simple, you just you get frustrated by it. So, um, something that I saw, something I did that I saw this reverberate from is um, I love native plants for my region. So I'm pretty passionate about it. I've worked at a couple of nurseries, blah, blah, blah. And my local native plant society asked me to give a talk last winter. And so I did. And it was surprising to me how many people, and I have a job, so I wasn't looking for work at the moment, um, but so many people who either were like, my friend saw your talk, or I saw your talk, called or messaged or emailed me to see if I would help them work on, you know, switching over their, you know, particular area at their house or whatever. So even something as simple as that, like Javon was saying, like, it, that was something I wanted to do. I'm never going to get on Instagram. I'm not going to do a podcast. That's not me. But I was willing to talk to a group that I'm already a member of about something I was super passionate about. And the the follow through or the follow up with that was, you know, if I was looking for work, I would have had easily had 10 jobs. So that was, that's just my experience. So. 100%. Great. Great point there. Yeah. Just Mindy, that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's go and do what you're willing to do and then build on that. So when I started uh, almost all the gar garden clubs in Vancouver, Vancouver Island area, I probably talked to all of them at least once about the subject of their choosing. Like once it was about Huga cultures, once it was about food forestry, they made buttons. Somebody had a button maker, like the old school buttons. And they're like, we want to make a button of your logo. And we want everyone to have one. I'm like, that's yes please. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, I once talked about water, rainwater harvesting. Uh, I talked about um, rainwater gardens, rain gardens. So yeah, that's great. What a great example. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Okay. Tamar, Tamara, Tamara has a couple of questions. I don't know if it was covered before, but does the food, food web course from Dr. Ingram worth it as an additional certification for designing professionally? Okay. Here we go. Let's let's answer this question well, so that way I don't bring down the ire from the Soil Food Web folks. Um, so, Dr. Ingham's class and Dr. Ingham's discoveries are groundbreaking in that she, through a series of experiments, I think in the late seventies, early eighties, basically started to identify all the different organisms within the Soil Food Web. Uh, the the many fungi, bacteria, microarthropods, protozoa, and nematodes, and then the upper layers, which is also arthropods, nematodes, earthworms, all these different animals that were interacting within the soil. And she did a, it's a really cool experiment. She did it by creating little terrariums and removing each element. So one soil, one soil sample that was growing a single wheat, a single wheat seedling, only had nematodes and only had fungi and only had bacteria. And she did all these different combinations to show that shock of shockers, they were all necessary. Um, Dr. Ingham's classes are very expensive when we take a look at the total package of going through the whole thing and then becoming a soil food web consultant 
becomes its own career path. To be a designer, do you need her courses? No, you don't. Uh, do you need to understand that the Soil Food Web is there? Yes. Do you need to understand what the Soil Food Web needs? Yes. Do you need to understand how to multiply and proliferate um, those elements? A hundred percent. Does that course necessarily give you all of that information? The first one is the fundamentals. No, the ones afterwards, you'll definitely get that, but you can get that just as much by asking me questions or by taking um, more of a soil uh, application course or reading a soil application book. So there's a couple of great folks out there. Um, actually, I just found it the other day. I, I was updating my uh, master list, which you guys have here right at the top of the, the spreadsheet. Actually, I should share my screen so everyone can see this. And let's do this. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go to soil, find soil. Uh, there we go. And the book was, ah, uh, this one. For the Love of Soil, Strategies to Regenerate Our Food Production Systems by Nicole Master. Um, this and uh, Dirt to Soil is fantastic. Um, and also Teaming with Microbes is fantastic. Those books will basically give you all the understanding you need to work with this. And until you're going to take all the time and effort to go and learn microscopy, which is taking a soil sample, putting it under a microscope, doing qualitative and quantitative counts for the different soil microorganisms, you know, that's not necessary. Um, learning how to make good compost extracts and teas is, however, I would say necessary in this work if you want to do this work well. Uh, the reason for that is uh, basically compost extracts and teas, aerated compost extracts and teas is taking good compost and then either extracting them, compost extract, into a water solution or proliferating, breeding them in a tea. And then they have different applications within the landscape. Uh, Joe Tobias of Root Shoot Design is uh, a post Dr. Ingham grad and is one of the most active and successful uh, soil food web consultants I know. She's, I highly recommend you follow her work. She does a lot of educational posts. I've, I've talked with her a little bit about how to post and how to create content. Um, her and I are going to be offering the understanding and working with living soils. We did this in 2019. Um, Joe Tobias, Root Shoot Soil. It's Root Shoot Soil. I always get it wrong. Root Shoot Soil or Root Shoot Design? Root Shoot, so root shoot Soils. Yeah. Joe. Um, fantastic, fantastic work she does. And so we're looking at doing a living soil food web uh, understanding and working with living soils. Again, we did one in 2019 that was, was sold out. Um, we had 30 spots and they were all sold out within a couple of weeks. Um, so that would be a great class to take. And it's 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 going to be a couple hundred bucks. It's not going to be a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but we're also not teaching microscopy. We're teaching how to develop the elements within the soil food web without having to go to that level of microscopy um, and still developing really good soil. So I would say if you can find a course like that, and uh, Nicole Masters has Integrity Soils. I think she still has an introductory course. I really like her approach to soils. I've adopted a lot of her work for soils. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate her work. Her her book's fantastic. Yeah, highly recommend it. Um, I don't think she's on an audiobook yet of it, which is unfortunate. And she also hasn't offered a digital ebook that, is outside the Amazon ecosystem, which is also unfortunate for for those of us that use eBooks, uh, and I use them religiously because um, I'm tired of carrying books around with me. So I've got a little e-reader called a Kobo e-reader. It's cross-platform, so it can take EPUB, Mobi, um, PDFs, the the works, uh, and I can I can read on it, make notes on it, and and I can also search those books, which is one of the reasons why I've moved to eBooks. It's been really good. Do you think that self soil microscopy part could be done self-learned? Mm. You know, if she has a series of books, or she did years ago. I think it was like six years ago. I was at a 
I was at a, what was I at? I think Permaculture Voices 2 or 3, one or the other. These, these were the big conferences that Diego Fuerter put on. Um, and she had her her textbooks, her kind of like step-by-step -step textbooks. So yeah, I think you could. The other thing you could do is you could reach out to somebody like Joe or somebody who's like a really good grad or um, uh, soil doctor Vivian um, out of, out of uh, Quebec or somebody like them down in the States. Michael Vertress, I think is another, another soil food web consultant I've worked with in the past. Um, and you could say, Hey, I want to mentor underneath you. And I, would like not like <laughs> what do I say this very very diplomatically um everybody who takes a soil food web course with Dr. Elaine Ingham is super stoked about the information but thinks it's very expensive and always says from my experience that there is more they had to go and learn and it wasn't the one-stop shop that they thought it would be and so my experience has been kind of her first crop of prime or or second students kind of have a more holistic view of the soil food web. This is this is true of all pioneers. So all pioneers within this space, they know what they know and they think it's they think that's it. They think that's the last thing you have to know. Alan Savory is the same way. Bill Mollison was the same way. Jeff Lawton's the same way. Very few of that first pioneer species in terms of people kind of have a more holistic view, which is funny because of the work we do. <laughs> um, so I, if I were I, and if I was in your position, I would, you know, reach out and say, Hey, Joe, I'd, I'd like to contract an hour of your time to basically say, I want to know what you know, how would you do it? What would be the way that you would go about it? So I would probably do it that way. I'm going to go back to your second question here. Uh, and completely out of subject, but uh, thanks, Tamara. Uh, nice thumbs up. Nice. Oh, it's animated now. Zoom made a big update recently. I'm completely out of subject here, but I'm doing soil tests, and I have six testing sites with the 30, 30 acres. Is that too much? What should I prioritize apart from growing sites? Should I test the site for future irrigation plan? Yeah, great question. So how how do you how do you um, uh, how do you then take and discern which one of these should be where? And actually, I'm just having um, a moment here where I know that uh, the person who goes in and takes all of the questions and then turns them into timestamps on the videos is won't have all of these. So I'm just going to put these down in um, in the template here, so that way we've got them. Great, awesome. Okay, so where and why would you test sites? So generally, uh, in the soil tests we're doing, which are, are basically just soil texture, um, you don't get a huge amount of information. I've been talking with OSU about expanding this to a, a biological assay as well. So basically, you get soil texture, which is great because you kind of get a sense of the soil and you get a sense of what that texture is, which can tell you what infiltration, percolation, um, and generally what you know, your cation exchange capacity will be in that loam has a higher cation exchange capacity, which is the soil's ability to hold on to nutrition, uh, also called CEC. And also you get a sense of the water holding capacity, the WHC, which is the ability for the, the soil to hold on to water. So generally you've got loam soils, which can hold on to water, which is available to plants. And you can also hold on to cation exchange capacity. So you can hold on to nutrition sandier soils usually have really good infiltration but also have really good drainage lower whc same thing with silt soils uh, clay soils slightly clay has a higher cation exchange capacity so organic matter and clay holds on to nutrition better because of the charge of the particles because basically clay has a positive and a negative charge on the little plates which are super tiny but when you're looking at an entire site if you're seeing uniformity within a site, so if you're seeing, well, this pasture, the vegetation looks generally all the same through this whole thing, generally the soil is going to be roughly the same underneath. So in that case, I probably, if I was taking a look at an area and the area looked pretty much all the same, wasn't a lot of change, I'd probably just take one soil sample. If we got into a forest that seemed distinct 
from the rest of the forest around me, I may take another soil sample if it made sense because I wanted to know generally what I would do if I was going to apply some kind of watering regime or planting regime there. If you're going to create an irrigation pond or any sort of water feature, definitely take a, a soil sample. And you'll probably want to do what's called a test slice or a test dig, which is you bring in an excavator, you go all the way down to the tip of the arm, and basically every scoop that comes out, you're doing um, the ribbon test. Um, the ribbon test is far more accurate than the shake jar test. We do the shake jar test so you can actually see the soil in front of you, and you can actually see the stratification of it, so that way you can start to learn what these soil samples are. Problem is there's so many factors that can go wrong in a soil test, including the curvature of the bottom of the jar. Have you added, have you added enough soap? Um, clays are different the world over and sometimes can take months or years to settle out of the water. Clay can take years to settle out of the water. So if it doesn't settle in the time that you have to take your measurements for the soil sample, don't worry, don't get frustrated. It's not necessary. Um, but that's what I would do. I would prioritize any planting zones any kind of vegetative zones that you're you're actively looking at doing forestry, animals, you name it, be good to know. Um, and then any sort of ir irrigation pond. Great question. Minthia. I love that your your short name on Zoom is Minmin. Min. I like that. I would have a question here in two today, since there aren't too many. I was watching the designing around the video, designing around fire video. We are very aware that it has been many decades since this has been a fire around here. And we know our turn is coming, could be next year. We are up a hill and surrounded by trees, mostly spruce, aspen. What are your top recommendations for resiliency around fire? How far away from structures should the nearest tree be? We love the feeling of living in the forest. We have a pipeline right of way that provides a good fire break from the south, but that is only a start. We have long grasses as we do not have any animals grazing the pastures. Okay, great question. And Mintia, I, knew, I know you just stood up, but if you can hear me, definitely give me the link to your assignment so I can look it up and we can chat about it site specific. So let's talk about again, patterns to details, patterns to details. And it's funny, I had this question last week. So <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm primed. Uh, so first and foremost, I made an entire documentary about this called Facing Fire, Building Resiliency to Wildfire on my YouTube channel. Definitely take a look. It's 22 minutes. It's very condensed, condensed. It's very yeah, it's dense. Um, I had a, a very popular and well-known uh, journalist from America review it for me. And he goes, great work, but instead of giving us knowledge and then waiting down our arms like a kid with a stack of books and then putting on the next book after you've told us something, give it time to breathe. Problem was, is I had a constraint because it was a grant-funded documentary and it had to be 22 minutes. And if you've learned anything about these Office hours is I try to give as much as I can in the time I have. And um, that old slow the person down element of any video um, video player is very good for rewatching. So <clears throat> first and foremost, fire is based upon a fire triangle. So we have a fire triangle and we have ignition. So how do we light the fire? We have oxygen, which is part of the fuel sources of oxygen. And then we have actual fuel sources. So that's called the fire, fire triangle. If we break any part of that triangle, if we take away oxygen, fire dies. If we take away ignition sources, fire dies. If we take away fuel sources, fire dies. So first and foremost, first principles, Richard Feynman, walk through a design concept with first principles in mind. How do I break the fire triangle around my house? If things are wet, we've taken away fuel because wet things don't burn. So consider that as a conversation. How do we break the fire triangle? When we get into good resources, Bushfire Safety, written by Joan Webster, OEM, of whom I did an interview with, a webinar with, and David Holmgren uh, on the YouTube channel, highly recommend that. We, we talk about all the little separate pieces of it, but she was a nurse turned journalist who researched fire and, and, and wrote about fire for years and literally wrote the book. This is the condensed version of the book, but she literally wrote the book that the Australian government refers people to and has been single-handedly credited with saving hundreds, if not thousands of people during the many major wildfires that Australia has had. So I highly recommend that book. It's the condensed version of Bushfire Safety. And I talk about it in the, the webinar, so check it out. Um, so first and foremost, fire breaks. So generally, we want um, kind of 15 meters, 30 feet from any facility area 
which is any infrastructure you want to keep in case of fire from a tree. Actually, let's take one more step back before we get there. So let's talk about different types of fire. So we have ground fire, which is on the ground. We have crown fire, C-R-O-W-N, that's in the trees. And generally what happens is the fire starts on the ground and it picks up speed and then it gets to ladder fuels. And those ladder fuels carries the fire up into the canopy. And then once it's in the canopy and it starts being in the canopy, it has much more oxygen, you get higher winds, and that's when uh, it moves to a conflagration and gets very hot and creates what's called an ember front. So it can throw embers upwards of a kilometer or two, a mile basically, in front of it, which is one of the major reasons why homes burn, because an ember will hit a dry house, house you should be dry, and it will start a fire. It's not usually flames licking a house that creates the issue. So I wanted to say that first, because as we go through all these processes, you're going to find that there's a number of elements here that could be very useful for you to, to consider. So let's go back to fire breaks. So fire breaks, <clears throat> fire breaks are either a break of vegetation or, and this is my definition, a garden. Why? Because a garden is wet, because you're growing it, because usually you're irrigating it or you have passive water harvesting features. Tomatoes don't burn. 99% water. So we need to have a fire break around our house. We did this. It was so nice when we got here in this house in Canada, because we had trees that were like three feet away from the house, but <laughs> we had major wildfires um, over the last 20 years in British Columbia. And when I, I started living here um, after I got an invitation from my now husband, uh, I was like, we have to remove these trees. And it was a big emotional battle because he likes living in the forest he likes feeling like he's in a treehouse but that's especially here as a ponderosa pine they're highly flammable they get super dry during the summer and they'll go up in a heartbeat so we created a 15 meter break around the house and i replaced it with gardens so i took that space and i turned it into something that was valuable for us and something that was very beautiful because when you look out and you can see your food security there's there's a sense of satisfaction there um, the second thing we did is because of my documentary, I started learning about prescription fire and cultural fire burning. And so I went down to Northwestern California. I went and learned how to light low intensity prescription fires with the Yurok tribe through the Cultural Fire Management Council. And I learned how to use slow and low intensity fire in the landscape. And it was fantastic. It was something I was petrified of because if you, if you've ever gone out, gone out camping, if you have any management messages from different institutions, or if you've been in Boy Scouts, don't light fires, don't light fires, don't light fires. So actively putting fire into a landscape was a uh, thrilling, scary moment for me. But there was an ancestral feeling I, I found from it. There was a feeling deep in my bones that this was something we've done for generations, which we have. We've managed our landscapes with fire for a long time. This is where you'll start to get dissension in the ranks where uh, some people within the permaculture regenerative agriculture circles do not condone any sort of fire lighting, saying that it's too much more carbon, under no circumstances should we do it. And then you'll have people like me who are on the opposite side, who looks at the full accounting of the carbon conversation, who also looks, that, looks at the bigger picture of climate change and realizes carbon is one metric and one indicator, and we really need to open up our minds about that because water, water that's turned from being held in the landscape, desertified and is now into the atmosphere is creating a lot of what we're seeing in terms of climate change. So for me, if I can remove fire damage and keep a property in ecological management and restoration for years to come because it hasn't totally burnt out, I see that as a net positive because if this house burns down, we're not here managing it. And if we're not here managing it, then all of the good we might do goes away. So if we need to do a little bit of slow and low fire around this landscape to keep it protected, I have no problem with it. But I just wanted to air the fact that there's multiple opinions of which David Holmgren does not believe in prescription fire, which is fascinating because we had a nice conversation about it on the webinar. So fire breaks are important. Um, using metal door screen or window screen to screen off 
any sort of infiltration places into the house, usually like under the eaves or underneath decks or anything like that is really important because that metal grate will basically reject ember. So if there is anything in the house that you can use, that works well. Keeping down vegetation is also important. So if you're not using fire, then animals work really well. Grazing animals can keep down that ground fuel to the point to where it's very difficult for it to light up. Because usually if we're coming down to what Joel Salatin calls boot stage, which is basically the animal eats down the grass, doesn't get to the crown of the grass, which if you get down to the crown of the grass, it's going to die. So you get down to what's called boot stage, which is kind of like the upper layer of the boot. Um, and it's usually green and it doesn't burn. So if you can keep that going, that works out well. We have horses or had horses. And so we used horses for that. They were a lawnmowers. Um, and that worked out really well. Uh, so we've got brakes. Oh, okay. The other thing I saw in 2015 when the major fire threatened the valley I was living in was people had inadvertently created hoover culture because they had these slash piles after doing uh, forestry, but they just kept on using it as a um, as a, a burden pile. So they kept on throwing um, more material on there. Um, and they created a hoover culture. And I saw it with my own eyes. I saw this grass fire, this ground fire come all the way up to this hugo culture and stop and logically it makes perfect sense after the fact but when you see it in real time you're like oh of course hugo cultures just hold water they're just decomposing logs that are there's they're sponges it's hard to burn a sponge and so i've started to use that specifically in my design work there's also something called bioberms which is basically if you have a condensed pile of mulch or like forest refuse and usually if it's sub a meter in cross section, so if it's a meter by meter by meter or two and a half, three feet by two and a half, three feet by three, two and a half, three feet, and it's this long on contour bioswale, and it's less than a meter, usually if it's well in contact, it will stay wet into the dry summer months. And so we've used that as well in experiments to see if that would help and it, and it has helped. So that's kind of an easier thing to do than a hygge culture, digging the trench, putting on the wood, putting on the soil, et cetera, et cetera. That's the newsroom. Um, so that keeps it down. The other thing is anything around the house, I'm also taking out my pruning pole or pruning saw and I'm pruning up to the extension of it, which is usually 10 to 15 feet, you know, three to four meters. So basically I'm, I'm pulling off the branches so that way the can I'm raising the canopy. So that way if there is a grass fire, it can't lick up into the canopy. So I'm removing those ladder fuels. So that can be super useful. The other thing is using earthworks, so things like terraces culture or what Sepp Holzer calls crater gardens. So these are stepped earthworks that hold and retain water, can be very useful to create water loving zones around our, our landscape. And then of course, if you do have an area that's a fire risk area, as we get into sectors this week, you'll be taking a look at that. If there's a fire risk area, fire works hotter and faster coming from a ground level, coming all the way up to the top, um, so if there is a forest or vegetation below you, that's a fire risk because it's going to come up. It's going to come hotter. Fire doesn't usually come downhill. It can if it's very hot, but doesn't usually jump downhill because of the way that oxygen works and because of the way that flames work. So it doesn't usually go in that direction. Um, what I would do there is I would think is, should I be thinning the trees, which is normally the case? Most of our trees are far too dense because we haven't allowed fire to come through. So most of our forests are too dense. And again, we're looking at sort of 10, 15 feet, 20 feet in between tree to tree, and then raising up that canopy. You have big forests like we do. Um, we have about 400 acres. You don't get to it all. So you can't do all of it. And also managing all of that vegetation, it's just, you're never gonna do it. It, it doesn't make any sense. That's where animals can make a lot of sense to run animals underneath forest to keep down grass cover and shrub cover. So we can increase the browsing. Browsing is the opposite of grazing for forests. If you have animals that uh, eat woody materials, that's browsing. If you eat grass, it's grazing. Uh, so all of those are really important pieces. What am I missing out that's pretty obvious? Oh, and then being conscientious about any sort of um, water deterrence. So sprinkler systems on the top of roofs have become very popular. Um, you need to be conscientious not to have them run electricity. If there is a fire in your area, electricity gets turned off first due to fire risk. So those usually have to be gravity fed or they have to be independent. They have to be independent on, on a generator or something of that nature. If it can be gravity fed, that's the best. 
um, and they have a very high success rate. The other thing I'll say, which is highly controversial, at least in Canada, and I think in the States as well, is that um, Joan Webster really advocates defending your home. No one's going to defend your home as well as you. And so she advocates to stay and actually defend your home and be prepared for it. So I would highly recommend reading her book, Bushfire, um, Bushfire Safety. And um, yeah, thanks. Great question. Great, great question. Thanks for that one. I'm just going to see if there's a follow-up. Um, yeah, any any follow-up to that, uh, Min Min? Sorry, I'm trying to find the buttons here. Um, that's awesome information. Thanks so much for all of that. Um, the other... Oh yeah, with the landscape fire, that's something that I'd be willing to get into. But how do I find some? Uh, how do I find someone that has the experience with that? Because I can't just light the land on on fire by myself. I wouldn't recommend it. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so either reach out to your local First Nations or your local firefighting, or reach out to the Cultural Fire Management Council, uh, which is run by um, Margot Robbins and Elizabeth Azus. And, and ask them, hey, I'm interested. What's the best way to me, for me to learn? And they may just recommend the route I did, which is you basically become a firefighter, which is hilarious. Um, you go and take firefighting courses and then you come up for a 10 day firefighting, fire lighting uh, uh, training. Um, it's it's one of the most incredible experiences I've, I've had in my life. It is uh, It rivals most of the vacations I've, I've taken because you're around like-minded people, you're learning from them, it's community oriented. There's lots of, cultural um storytelling and and learning so i would reach out to them and see um you know if they know of anything in your area or who they would recommend the nature conservancy oh there we go the nature conservancy of the u.s as well uh regularly hosts training so you may want to reach out to them and see what they know okay cool awesome thanks for that info yeah you're welcome uh nicole masters for the love of soil is available for audible nice that is the book i recommend yep great and then in Tamara, crazy how fast fires can spread. I went camping to the French River last year and we had to turn it off and we had to turn off a fire by ourselves that was spotted. We thought it was campsite, but when the smoke was too much and we were hauling water from the lake to put it out. Yeah, spread by roots. What's even crazier, and this has been happening in the tundra and the taga and the boreal forest in the north, is fires will start in the late fall they will bury underground into roots and into um, muskeg and peat, and they'll stay lit over the winter. They'll stay slowly smoldering and they'll come up first to spring immediately. It is wild how quickly that happens. So there's lots of little interesting things about fire. I highly recommend um, watching that documentary I put together um, only because I talk about all this stuff and um, it's amazing to learn about fire. It's such a fascinating element. The writer, if you want to learn about fire and our our lack of understanding of it, is Stephen Pine, um, or Payne, pardon me. Uh, he's interviewed in the documentary and has great books about fire, specifically in North America. So look at that, folks. We got through all our questions right up to the hour. We only have a minute left. Um, I was going to go through the sector analysis quickly only because you guys are all here and I can show it to you. So maybe I will do that still. Um, and also just kind of head off some of the issues I always see. So why don't we do that for everybody? Um, the site challenges are pretty straightforward. You're going to have the same conversation you always have for me, which is if you don't do the... Um, bum, 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 there we go. Uh, if you don't do your URLs and you don't do your access dates, I'm going to have to talk about it. I'm going to take marks away. You're going to have to go back and do it. So, you know, just remember within site and regional challenges, just to remember to source everything, remember to do bolded highlighting. If you want, use the colored bolded highlighting. It's a nice way to start to work with that visual language, which is really important if you ever do corporate or community work. Um, this type of, it's a very simple trick, but um, for groups that then have to read something publicly or as a group and then make a decision as a group to greenlit your work, uh, make sure to go through the problems and weaknesses. If there are, you only have three or four, delete the extra rows and just increase the font. So really work on that idea of filling up the slides um, as a visual language piece. That's important. We all know about the SWAT by now. Sector. Okay. 
So a couple of things that people continually miss is that you do have to put in, you'll see a requirement here to put in where's the closest elements. You'll see this in the uh, in the materials. So you definitely have to put these in. Where's the closest grocery store? Where's the closest this and that? Um, make sure to put in your solar angles. That'll be a first for most of you taking a look at the solar angles. I go into it in the tutorials. So how to calculate so solar angles is up there. Um, and also Sun Earth Tools, which is a great tool set. Um, a lot of folks enjoyed my way of doing this, which is taking the full compass and putting it on here. So we've got the degrees. So that can be great to do. Um, last, last assignment or last class, we had somebody do this approach differently. So instead of these big blocks, they just created a table and had everything to the left, which meant that the sector analysis could be bigger. So I included that. So there's two options. You don't have to do both, right? It says here, this is an alternative layoff. Uh, this layout in the previous one, do not submit both. But this can be just a lot easier to use and you don't have to worry about trying to fit everything onto one slide. So I really like this. And this is what's so great about this class is we've got thousands of students who come through this every year. So we see a lot of innovation here. So if you want to do it this way, um, people have asked multiple times, is there a better way to work with the half circles? There isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can just do pie charts, which is up here. So you can just do a shape as a pie chart, um, which is basically a half circle. So you can bring in this half circle and then you can design a little bit of it. So if you just want to do rays, that's fine as well. If you don't want to worry about being making this perfect, if you're like me and you have a little bit of OCD, that can get frustrating. Um, so that's all well and good. Uh, make sure to use the coloration that we use here. So use is green, deflect is red, and uh, amplify is blue. Um, that's pretty much it. Is there any questions about the sector analysis by anybody? Any thoughts, questions, queries, quotations? I'm going to check the chat. No. Okay. Awesome. Any final questions from anybody before we we leave today? No, nope. shaking of heads. Great. Um, how was the office hours today? Did you feel that you got something out of it? Was it worth your time? Valuable? Shaking of heads. Yeah, uh, it was great. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Great. Awesome, folks. Well, um, continue on your merry little ways. Um, Continue to do the work as quickly as you can. Um, I talked about this in the first assignment. I like a hit and run approach to my assignments. Um, I'm in school right now as well. So I like reading it, think about it, come back to it, do the things I find easy, and then you know have a dedicated amount of time to go deeper into the work. Um, you have to uh, do it by yourself, but you don't have to do it alone. So if you are struggling, if there is a frustration, reach out to me by email, jamin at allpointsdesign.ca. And... Um, um uh was happy to happy to have a quick zoom call a couple of you reached out it's been super fun to chat with you lucius uh honestly love getting off topic about permaculture work it isn't off topic this is a permaculture design pro class so any questions you have about designing business please let me know i'm looking at doing a beta group probably in the new year for a year and we'd be meeting probably once or twice a month and it would be specifically for post pdc grads of this course who are looking for mentorship or advice about how to get in to this type of work. So if that's interesting to you, I'll probably be putting out um, an interest list probably within the next couple of months coming into December. Your class goes over December, but we always have a class finishing in December. So if that's of interest to you, definitely take a look for that. And thanks so much, folks. It was a pleasure. Uh, hope it goes well, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a bit, Javin. Have a great couple of weeks. <laughs> you too, sir. All the best, everybody. Take care. Bye.